Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Frankie Billingsley, member of the Officials Development Committee for Softball Canada and the host for your webinar this evening. Tonight's theme is communication, communication between umpires and coaches. And tonight we are looking at this from a coach's perspective. I have two speakers lined up for you this evening. Um, but before we get to them and before I get to introduce them, I just wanted to tell you a little bit of background about where the impetus for this session came from. As some of you may know, I have been repping basketball for quite some time. And one of my basketball bosses year to, years ago invited a university level coach to speak to our university level officials. And it was pivotal for many referees in that room to have had the opportunity to speak to a coach about all sorts of different topics. Tonight's topic is going to focus on communication, but for those of you who are in attendance, feel free to take this opportunity to ask, you know, a whole range of questions that you might never have had the opportunity to ask before. In addition to my experience of having such an awesome opportunity to chat with a coach in the past, in the 21 years that I've been involved in softball, I've never seen a coach been invited to an educational opportunity, and I thought, since Jeff Whipple kindly gave me the academic and administrative freedom to do sort of what I wanted with these webinars, I thought this would be such a great opportunity to try something so new and so refreshing and something that's never been done. So thank you so much for indulging me in this, but I think you're really going to find it. Um, I think you'll take a lot away from it. There'll be a lot of gold nuggets out of here. So uh, without further ado, our first speaker tonight is Andrea Wolf. Andrea has been involved in the game of softball most of her life. She played competitively for over 20 years, receiving a four-year scholarship from Jamestown College in North Dakota and played two years for Seki Boyan in Japan. Andrea began coaching in 2000 and has gone on to coach at several Western Canada Summer Games, the Jeux Canada Games and Canadian Collegiate Championships. She is a graduate of the Canadian Sport Institute Advanced Coaching Program and is currently a Softball Canada Board Director. Andrea, could you please turn on your camera? There we go. There we go. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you, welcome. Thanks for having me tonight. I'm just trying well, to uh, get my slideshow set up here. No problem. Awesome. So uh, whenever you are ready, you can share your screen so that people can. Okay, well, I think, are you able to see it, Frankie? No. Okay. There we go. Uh, now we're I seeing it. it. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, so I'm gonna leave you to do your presentation and I will um, come back on after you're done. Sure. Thanks, Frankie. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you to the uh, Softball uh, Canada ODC for giving me this opportunity to speak with you uh, this evening. I really appreciate um, being part of this uh, web webinar with Mark and, and Frankie and, and the expertise and experience uh, that they both bring to the game. And, and welcome all our, our participants for um, joining us tonight, taking time out of their uh, busy schedules to listen to uh, the coaches speak on this topic. And a real special thank you to Mark for taking time from his training uh, with the Olympic team in Florida to, to spend time with us this evening. So my goal this evening is to share with you from you know my experiences over the years as a coach, uh, things that I've seen, things that I do, uh, and things to avoid that um, will assist communication and make our working relationship better. And although the majority of my uh, coaching is with, on the high performance side, I do spend um, quite a bit of time locally here with, with uh, kind of the U12 age group. And I've, I've tried to incorporate some of, of those experiences in uh, this evening, what I'm gonna talk about. You know, coaches and umpires, you know, on the field, we have different roles, um, but we're really similar in more ways than we think. And our biggest similarity is our passion um, for this sport. And I, I think it's no secret that we live in two different worlds and, and uh, the coaches, we have our world and, and our objective is to win and, and the umpires, you have your world and, and your objective is to manage the game within the context of the rules. And, you know, I think how we combine those rules um, 
so that our both objectives are met is really important. And it's really important in, in where they meet in this, this area is how we best handle it and assist communication that, that is going to help us build that uh, on-field relationship and what we can do to create um, a positive non-combative environment. So I, I, I'd like to start off because I, I heard that there were some coaches in, in the room and, and I think it's, it's nice to share with umpires um, from, from what I do as a coach that helps keep the, you know, the game um, positive for my, my participants. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, things that I, I do. Um, so I think it's really important that parents and, uh, or that coaches have a parent player meeting um, to communicate with our parents and, and players our expectations and behaviors towards officials. Um, take the opportunity to educate them. Uh, I do a, a meet and a greet um, with the parents of all my teams and uh, my University Canada games. And I just have a short presentation prepared. And, and part of that includes, you know, acceptable and, and non-acceptable behaviors from the stands and in the dugouts. And, and if I'm coaching my U12 team, I provide my parents with, you know, a list of the, the top 10 misunderstood rules. It's really important for me to learn the rules and, and uh, understand the rules and attend an umpire clinic, pick the brains of the umpires. Um, it gives me such an edge over my opposition, um, knowing the rules, uh, situations I can make plays on that perhaps the opposition doesn't know. Uh, it helps me to know what um, situations I can appeal, protest, uh, or what calls I can and can't question. And my players, will have, they do have more confidence knowing that I have a better handle on, on the rules and, and uh, you know, when to, when to approach and the best way to approach that umpire um, uh, to talk about the rules. I always like to work with an umpire. Um, I might be one of the few coaches that do that, but I, I think it's important that we talk to the umpires away from the game, um, run scenarios by them, ask for clarification. Uh, um, umpires are a part of our game. And so I invite them into our practice when, when I have the opportunity. If I know um, in, that there's a first time uh, youth umpire that needs, it, needs some experience, I'll, I'll invite them to our inner squad um, so that they can practice in a non-threatening environment. And, you know, I like to invite the, the level fives to work with my Canada games and university athletes. Um, you know, the rule changes with the pitching rule. It was really important for me to have them come in and and uh, talk about the pause and, and whether stepping back and pausing was that we were doing it correctly and we interpreted that rule correctly as well. Um, and I think it's important at, at any age to let the athletes uh, have a question and answer with the umpire. Um, uh, you know, I assume my players are going to learn the rules as they come up and when they're working with other coaches, but that's not always the case. And I don't think we can ever start that young enough um, having them experience, you know, the role of the umpire as well. I think it's really important that my players understand the rules and, and what to do in scenarios. So, you know, unfortunately, most teams don't have the luxury of having a, the same team for four years. Um, but it's important to create um, things that are going to happen and scenarios are going to happen in the game and why those happen. So you know, practicing rundowns, I show my defense how to avoid an obstruction and my offense on how to draw it and, and the result of that. And I think, you know, I'm always shocked if there's, you know, my rookies come in and they at that level and they don't know what an obstruction inter interference is or even what the result of that is. So, you know, again, introducing the umpires and the rules um, during a practice can and should be done even, you know, at the youngest of ages. And it's really fun for the younger, the younger kids. I, f I feel that I have an obligation to protect the youth umpire. I mean, we have a lot of people that um, quit officiating um, after a first uh, year because they might have conflict with um, with uh, adults and, and other coaches on the field. So, you know, my job as a, as a coach is to create a safe environment for my, my players. And I think I, that extends somewhat to the youth umpire as well. It's very intimidating for a, a young person to manage grown adults and, you know, if opposition fan or umpires or players are, are acting inappropriately, um, it's it's part of my job to know that that youth umpire, you know, I'll support them. And I think it's, you know, although I'm not going to step in and manage, they think they need to know that I'm there um, as a support. And I, I'm, I'm really passionate about developing education and coach education. And I think communication and, and approaching and working with umpires that's a key area that's missed um, in our coach certification clinics, especially at the community coach level. 
Um, as coaches, we're so focused on skills, um, but to me, learning how to communicate and approach an empire, or even other coaches, it's a forgotten skill. And our, our clinics touch a little bit on fair foul, you know, um, lineups and what the DP flex is, um, but we don't learn how to approach an empire. And common sense tells us the do not, but I would really love to see a resource that, that's, you know, developed that's hands on on the do's and the how's. And I, I think that will look like working with an umpire, not just tending a rules clinic. A lot of times at the community level, you have one umpire, there's no plate conference, there's no lineup cards. And then, you know, when coaches go outside of their league and or maybe to a provincials or to a higher level, all of us, a sudden they're exposed to these new things that they haven't been doing all season. Um, and I think it's really important that we show them, hey, there is gonna be a plate conference, there is gonna be a lineup, this is how you use it. And, and here's times that you should should approach um, because a lot of times the coach only knows what they coach and, and it's it's a bit of a lack of education when they're pro approaching um, the umpire. So I want to talk a little bit about the approach um, because ultimately um, it really is about the approach and it, and it begins the minute we step onto the field and, and understanding why we're both there. The game's not for me to coach or for umpires to officiate. It's about the players and the spirit of the game and it really begins with bringing a positive attitude um, to the field. I'm there because I love the game and I love coaching and working with the athletes. And I think the participants need to feel and see that from both um, coach and umpire. You know, whether I'm coaching extra inning game at the Canada Games or 3,000, you know, people in the stands or the gold medal game at the university championships or just in the next town over um, at a local U12 game with, with just a few parents in the stands, that game has equal importance to those participants and I, and you know we need to treat it as such so showing up early you know looking professional being respectful and taking the game seriously that starts the communication because it sends a positive message um, you know how we handle ourselves and and at all levels of competition should never change and it has an influence on, on um, you know how how communication will play out Participants, they don't know that I'm a high performance certified coach. They don't know that the umpire that they have is a level five certified coach. I don't know that the opposing coach, this might be their first time ever coaching or their first time ever coaching at a high level event. And I don't know that it's the umpire's first game they're umpiring or the first time that they're officiating at a high level event. And so there's a lot of emotions and nerves and, and I think we need to work together to respect that. Um, but we don't know where they're coming from either. So if someone acts better than me or is a showboat on the field, um, it, I find it really difficult to work with someone like that and communicate with that person. You know, I don't want to approach them um, because I don't know what the reaction will be and I really don't want to give them something that they can create a scene uh, about. Um, you know, when I, uh, when I have to coach in that environment, I become more protective of my players and what's said and done um, around them and to them. I think it's really hard to keep focused and uh, keep things in check when, when I face an opposing coach or players that have an arrogance or a bad attitude. And, and uh, because I feel like part of that game is taken away from me and, and it's kind of out of my control. And, and I think it's the same thing when I have an official that shows up with that same attitude. It, it makes it very difficult to coach um, because these, these attitudes are really difficult to communicate with. And I tend to walk on eggshells and, and I'm in defensive mode because I'm expecting a negative reaction and it's intimidating and uncomfortable. And, and when I do have to approach them, you know, the communication more often than not is, is probably going to be argumentative and negative just because of the vibe that, that I'm getting from them. I think we need to start every um, game and inning, you know, treat it like every act as an independent, uh, <clears throat> as an independent event. Let's not carry what happened from previous games or previous innings um, into the next event or next inning. And, and you know, I've, I'm guilty of it too, where I see an opposition coach where I maybe, you know, didn't like how our communication went. And, and I prejudged, prejudged them and went, oh, well, this, I know how this game is gonna unfold. But if we can check that at the door and um, <clears throat> not let it shut us down from having positive communication, it will really, you know, help us going into the new, into that new game. I think role model behavior is we, we're leaders and we always have to behave like we're role models and we both coaches and umpires we have eyes and ears on us all the time and I think we need to behave as if we're on sports center my behavior will reflect 
um, how my parents and my the fa my uh, players will act and react, and, and at all times I, I have to you know make sure that I that everyone around me sees that I am a role model and and what I do is acceptable. And I know not all coaches do this, and there's you know there's coaches that fly out of the dugouts and they're kicking dirt and you know making this what what you know what is that about kind of gesture, um, but. You know, I think that opens up a door to have the players and parents act that way too, and it sets the tone. And communication isn't going to go well in in those scenarios, and let alone an umpire that even wants to maybe communicate with me or with a coach like that. It, it's truly a ripple effect when that happens, especially if a coach loses control or is emotional over a call. That vibe it goes back into the dugout, and then it goes back onto the field with the players. And I'm really competitive, so when I see this happen, I, I know that the coaches already unfocused and, and you know losing a bit of control so I'm going to take advantage of that and I can't control what other um, coaches do or, or you know towards umpires but I really don't want that to reflect how I'm going to be able to um, you know approach an umpire and communicate with them and I really don't want that to hinder hinder that working relationship that we have on the field and I think at times if I have that positive um, behavior and, and and the things that I say I can be a buffer to help maybe calm the nerves and and help that ump umpire re refocus knowing that I'm not they're not going to get that attitude from me um you know if I really appreciate as a coach when an umpire shuts down that behavior and manages the game confidently and well it, it's irritating for me when when um there's nitpicking on every single rule or every single ball and strike and fair and foul and um, be it from a coach or an umpire, because it disrupts the flow and the focus of the game, and and it's distracting. And then all of a sudden, uh, you 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 have a little bit of conflict of how you want to communicate or approach um, approach that, because the game, the focus of the game is shifted now. And I need to be focused to be able to call plays. Uh, I need my players to be focused um, to make the plays, and I need the umpires to be focused to make the calls, and especially to be able to make the the big calls uh, for the big plays. The, the timing of the approach, <clears throat> I think there's there's always going to be times after a play where we, you know, we're going to have to go out and approach each other. Uh, um, a lot of times it's to see what or like what happened in, that they saw that that I didn't see uh, or that I saw differently. And I think there's a lot of times we can have conversations with each other um, without even anyone knowing that we're having those conversations. As soon as I, as a coach, um, call time, you know, everyone in the park or the players even know, okay, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to be, you know, talking to this umpire and probably questioning, you know, and, and making a judgment on their ability. Um, and so I think, you know, I know that I can, <clears throat> that a safe and out, a ball and a strike is a judgment call. But as, as a coach, I want to have a conversation as why was it? Um, and so I pick and choose when I approach. And there's times where I'm going to have a conversation um, with an umpire in, bet umpire in between innings. And there's times where I'm going to use my lineup card um, to create an opportunity to um, start that conversation. So I'll approach as if I'm going to be making a substitution and be honest and say, hey, I'm, I'm, it looks like I'm making a substitution. I'm not changing anything in my lineup, but I want to talk to you and I really don't want the whole ballpark privy to what we're going to say. And it's these little things that that, that I think and, and the reactions that I've had to it have been very positive. And so I, I think that it shows that we can talk as a coach and, you know, from I'm going to talk to you as a coach and I'm not going to demean or, or I'm going to respect you in, in that on the ways that I um, time my approach. I like to communicate with uh, the umpire through my players. So I, it's important to me that, um, you know, my players bring everything back to the dugout. And so working with my players, my catchers, my first baseman, my third baseman on, on building a positive rapport with the umpire. So they can just casually ask questions that really I don't need to come out and, and stop the game and, and um, you know, perhaps create a conflict. Um, they can ask those questions and then it just limits the, the amount of approaches um, that I will have to make. And the times that I have to go out and have the conversations with, with the umpire. You know, body language conveys a meaning. Uh, a calm, confident, respectful presence on the diamond and in the dugout. Um, that tells me that we're both approachable and communication is po is going to be positive and that we're, you know, that we're very respectful of each other. You know, I, I think looking at each other in the eye when we converse for understanding and smiling, you know, this pointing fingers and rolling eyes and, and shrugging shoulders with hands up. It just, it just 
tells the entire park that we aren't working well together um, and you know that we, we think each other is in, um, you know accusing each other of bad judgment so to me when I, I see someone standing with crossed arms hard-nosed look um, and although that might be their in the z in the zone go game look um, to me that gives me a vibe that that person is not approachable and maybe even angry and so it's intimidating and tends I tend to put my guard up and and again go into a little bit of a defense mode be, just because of what they're portraying to me I really really think plate conference sets the whole tone of the game um, I'm always trying to get a read on my opposing coach and umpires you know how we're going to work together and 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 approaches to the games um, so I think we need to establish our respect at the at the plate, um, remove our, our sunglasses so that we can be make con eye contact. Let's be friendly, talk with each other and, and not to each other. You know, no one likes to be dictated to. And I think that establishes that the communication amongst us is gonna be difficult if that happens. Um, this is where we can, I think there's no, um, no wrong way for a coach to ask or, or you know if you don't know or if it's the first time you're coming to an event and you're not sure when or how to approach you know ask the questions you know mr umpire you know when when is the best time if there's a call that i can come talk to you and so everyone's on the same page and it tells the opposition coach too hey that you know we want to all be on the same page when we're when we're all working together on the diamond so on my last slide uh i just I, I want to talk about some key points of communication, you know, that I've experienced and 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 working with umpires and and other people on the dime. And I think these are these are really important for our communication with each other. Um, let's let's be honest with with each other. Um, tell me what you saw differently, and I'll tell you what I saw differently. You know, if there's a call missed, then then tell me. But you know, don't talk around me. Let's not talk down to each other. No one is perfect. We know we're going to make mistakes. The coach is going to make mistakes. Umpires are going to make mistakes. That's just human nature. Um, I th we really need to respect one another. Respect is earned. So I feel like earning, I'll earn respect from umpires by managing my participants. And that's really important to me. The last thing I need is when I've worked so hard to build this communication and working relationship is to have someone else say and do something that's going to hinder it. And then, you know, it just, it just makes a, a, a bit of a bad vibe for everyone and I don't want everyone affecting that any anything affecting that line of communication between us and and I think that's reciprocated as well I like an official that manages that part of the game well and we all know it's difficult to refocus um, and keep in check when someone is being disrespectful and and like a player you know when a player is in a zone and they're having a really good game and, and just a terrific performance that's how I need an umpire to be um, you know have that ter terrific performance so you know that the best calls are made and I think being polite and responding to each other and not brushing each other off uh, let the conversation finish and acknowledge that it's finished before we both return to our positions it just shows shows that we do respect the rules that that we both um, have on the field being approachable like let's let's be able to come to each other let me come to you let me talk to you um, you know if I'm going to be stopped the minute I, I step out the dugout, step out of the dugout, it, it takes a part of the game for me and ties my hands. I kind of feel like I'm helpless that I can't say what I need to say or talk with an umpire. And, and so, I, I, you know, ultimately, I think I'm not coaching as effective as I can. Um, we don't know what conversations are going to be when we approach each other. And so I want an umpire to feel as comfortable approaching me as I, I want to be a, a, approaching the umpire especially if there's a concern with with myself or my team you know integrity having integrity is really important it can be defined as aligning our conduct to what we know to be excellent um, you know unrealistically I want the call to be perfect each time but we're human and we make mistakes as I mentioned before and and the right call might not be made but let's make the the call right and so, you know, I don't want a call made um, to be made um, because a call was missed previously or a strike zone adjusted because there's lots of complaining from the stands. You know, I want my players to earn the outs and earn the runs. And if we didn't do that, it's not because of a, um, a call that an umpire made. It's because we didn't execute when we needed to. Um, and that, it, that it's as simple as that. And it's really tough because parents are a tough crowd. And it's hard for them to accept that, you know, the result of the game is because their, their kid wasn't good enough. It's just so much easier to say, well, the umpire blew it for us. And, 
And so I think that is something integrity that we have to have throughout both coaching and, and our part through, throughout the game. Listening to one another is really important. Um, I genuinely, as a coach, I have concerns and I, and I want to be heard. And no matter what situation in life, people always feel better if they have a chance to talk and communicate their concerns. And so that's, that's no different than on the ball field. So, you know, there's a chance I may not even respond if I'm listening well, um, because by the end of the conversation, we're both, you know, both might be on the same page. I think it's really important that we choose our words wisely. Um, you know, being blamed always puts us into a defensive mode and, and, and then we just want to attack when we communicate. And so I think we need to talk, um, talk as if we're not blaming each other. Again, I know I can't question balls and strikes, but, but every umpire has tendencies. And so for my players to be able to execute, um, we need to know how to adjust to those tendencies. So, you know, asking questions like, you know, is my Mr. Umpire, is my, is my catcher setting up too low or is my catcher setting up too wide? Uh, did my players miss the tag or, or, you know, was my player under the tag? And, you know, I appreciate when umpires will say, hey, coach, can you ask your on-deck hitters, grab the bats or, or a coach, can you ask your players to hustle out? Because there's so much going on in the game that I might not be paying attention to that. But I really appreciate that, you know, that's part of the game. And, and that's something that I want to make sure that I keep in check with, with my athletes. Um, so once the game um, starts, I think it's really important that we keep the, the lines of communication open throughout the entire game. And we need to let each other know that those lines are open. So things like passing each other uh, in between innings and quietly acknowledging, you know, a good call or a good play. It's just a simple way of letting each other know, hey, things are still working well. Um, and I haven't forgotten, we haven't forgotten, you know, that we're there for each other. So let's enlighten, you know, not debate. Let's explain and not argue. Uh, let's continue to educate ourselves educate each other in this area of communication and working together on the field because it so importantly makes the game you know so much more fun for for everyone involved and you know it's going to happen that we don't agree but i really think it's important that we disagree with class uh, so frankie that that really wraps up and what i have to share this evening and and i hope in this really short time i could go on and on about this is such a great topic um and i hope that i've been able to give uh, a bit of a different perspective on communication from the eyes of a coach and I'll hand the screen back over to you Frankie and then I look forward to hearing what what uh, Mark's going to share with us and answering any questions that we have afterwards yeah thanks Andy. Oh, thank just you. before you just before you go um I just wanted to to say I mean just before you go and then come back later <laughs> hmm. um, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation and say and I just find it so fascinating to to listen to um again like we haven't had coaches invited to, to speak to umpires since like somebody reminded me we did have coaches come to a blue convention about like 12 mm -hmm. years ago so and and i should have remembered that because larry lynch was one of them and i remember asking him <laughs> you know, i was in my fourth year and i was like do you do you care if, if females umpire your games anyway it was a pivotal moment because everybody at blue convention was there anyway so i apologize for misstating we have had coaches come and talk to umpires before but it's mm -hmm. been a long long time and we have someone with us that's um uh, an international level official from a different country and and just a comment was was made to me privately that that they've never had the chance to hear a coach speak before so I, I I do think this is a valuable experience and exchange of ideas and I just wanted to highlight a couple of the things that you mentioned that that concept of a positive approach and the plate conference setting the tone those are things that we actually talk about in the level one manual and and interestingly enough you know if you put that those two pieces in combination with every game as a fresh start mm -hmm. um just a really nice reminder for all of us regardless of the level level that we hold that it doesn't really matter what game you're doing um it's a fresh start when people don't know who you are and i think sometimes when we when we have achieved great successes we have a tendency to rest on those laurels and i mean this has happened to me in both of the sports i officiate where we come off of a you know, I'm in I'm in really intense games at the highest level, and then two or three days later, me and one of those people is in what would be considered a very recreational game or a junior high game, and the game is going a little wonky. And after the game, the official turns to me and says, "Well, like, just don't they know who I am?" And one time, I almost cracked up, and they said, "What's so funny?" I go, "Well, no, they don't know." Who they you don't are. exactly. So, like, <laughs> that's the whole point. Like, every game is like you've got to give your best because they don't really care that you're an international level umpire right. they don't care that you you know that they just want they just want your best effort that night right Absolutely. so i just think it's such a such a great reminder so thank you so much um thank you 
I will see you in a little while. Our next presenter tonight is uh, probably a name that's very commonly known in the softball circles. So Andy, you can turn off your uh, camera if you'd like and join us later. Mark Smith, welcome Mark. Mark played on the men's national softball team for 15 years. He's a three-time world champion, six-time Pan American gold medalist, three as a player, three as a coach. Mark's been the recipient of one of Nova Scotia's top 15 all-time greatest athletes. He's been inducted into the Nova Scotia Sport Heritage Hall of Fame, the Canadian Softball Hall of Fame, the International Softball Congress Hall of Fame. He was the recipient of the Jack Donahue Coach of the Year Award in 2016. Mark is a high performance director. He's been coaching a national team for 20 years and he currently holds the role of the head coach of the Canadian Women's Softball Olympic Program. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Andy. Thank you, Arif Andy. Hi, Frankie. Thank you. Hey, do you want to turn your camera on? Okay. How am I doing? Awesome. Nice to see All you. Right. You as well. <laughs> Here's okay, well. so Mark, right now I can see uh, your presentation, your header slide in the middle, and then all your slides on the left. How's that? Still the same. There. There we go. Okay, I will see you in a little while. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hello, folks. It's nice to uh, it's nice to be with you tonight, and I thank you to to Frankie and Donna, Softball Canada, and the uh, ODC for the opportunity to be here. Um, it was great to listen to Andrea talk about her experiences as a coach, and mine will come uh, primarily from the elite or the international level, but quite honestly, it, it, in my mind, it doesn't really matter. I think coach-umpire relationships are important at every level of our sport, and so the approach or the things I'll share tonight are really um, universal, it, whether you're coaching at you know, the national team level, as I have for the last number of years, or whether you're coaching at a youth level. I really think it applies uh, regardless of the age or stage of development that we're speaking of. I've got an image here of three, uh, three different classes. Um, one is an elementary school class, one is a junior high class, and one is a high school class. And the question asked, what do these, represent, what do these images represent to you? And I use these three images because what I'm trying to illustrate is that regardless of the age or stage of development that we coach or we officiate at, the, the recipients or the participants deserve our best effort. If I'm coaching or working with 12 year olds, they deserve as much of my attention. If you're officiating a game with 12 year olds, they deserve your attention. I think sometimes, it, and I think it happens quite easily when we've been around a sport for a period of time or we've achieved a certain level of success, we tend to look beyond perhaps some of the early years or early stages of things we've done. And I've had conversations with colleagues back in Nova Scotia across different sports who have had a lot of experience officiating and have often talked about not enjoying when they co when they officiate the younger age groups of, of athletes. And, you know, we've had some pretty good discussions around the fact that, you know, those young people deserve the same level of attention you would give a high school team or that you would give a university team or that you would give a, a professional team. It's important, I think, that we convey the message of professionalism and leadership and role modeling. And it doesn't matter which level we step on the field with, we are on display and our behavior and attitude is on display every time we step on the field. So I think it's important as coaches and as officials that we understand that if we've signed up to do the job, we have an obligation and a responsibility to put our best foot forward, regardless of the age group or stage of development or level that we coach or officiate at. I think it's important to know your audience from an umpiring perspective, understanding the age group you're going to coach, you're going to officiate this weekend or, or perhaps for a tournament event or a championship. You know, what are the type of, what's the skill level that I can expect of the athletes that I'm going to officiate against? What is their general knowledge of the game? What is their attention span going to be like? Uh, what can I expect them to understand? And from a fundamental understanding of the game, versus what are things I'm going to need to speak to a coach about? And then what are my expectations of game management? And Andrea spoke to the home plate meeting, which I'm not certain how often that happens at the younger levels of the sport, but I would encourage that it should happen at all levels of the sport because it provides that first opportunity for a coach and an umpire to come together and start a casual conversation around expectations for the game kids hustling on and off the field, making sure that there's a backup catcher to receive warm-up pitches, 
um, you know, ensuring that kids are staying in the dugout so that they're safe, ensuring somebody's picking up the bats, ensuring somebody's getting foul balls, um, the expectations around parent behavior. I think it provides an opportunity to have a conversation that sets a tone and an expectation for the way you want the relationship to be managed. And from my perspective, the official is the person who's in charge of the game. So my part in that game is that I've got a team on one side of the field that is trying to compete against a team on the other side of the field. And my job as a coach is to make sure that the, 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 the playing field is level, that any concerns I have are being heard by the official and that we can operate in a respectful manner. So I think that tone is set by the official in terms of your willingness to uh, have a casual conversation, to maintain eye contact, uh, a good hearty handshake once we get back to being allowed to shake hands. Um, but those things set a tone and an expectation of expected behavior. On the flip side, from a coaching perspective, I think sometimes we have coaches that lose sight of the age group they're coaching and they have expectations of kids' behaviors to execute or perform at a level that sometimes is two or three years beyond their capability. And in those situations, we tend to have the coach that flies off the handle and coaches a group of 12-year-olds as though they're 17-year-olds and is very focused on win losses as opposed to athlete development. And in most of those types of scenarios, there's, there's usually going to be some difficult um, conversations to be had by coach and official, especially if things aren't going the way the coach would like. So coaches also have a responsibility to understand the age group they're coaching, what they should be expecting. You know, I cringe when I hear coaches at the youth level or the youngest of levels talk, so talking about wins and losses, because my belief is that we're in the athlete development business. And it's about teaching young people skills that they can move forward and graduate to the next level, having learned those particular skills and then are able to apply new things that they learn. Whether we win or lose has very little to do with whether or not we're developing the, 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 the ball player. There's only one team that wins a national championship or a provincial championship every year, but there are dozens, if not hundreds of teams that participate. So I think the mindset of a coach in terms of knowing what your absolute role is in the youth development process or the athlete development process in our country is really important. And I think that gives context to the way you coach and the experiences that the athletes will have. And then... What are the expectations of the, um, uh, what are my expectations of an umpire? And I can tell you that my expectations of an umpire really haven't changed from my days of playing the game, which were a long time ago. And that is, I want somebody that is fair. I want somebody that is respectful. I want somebody that is willing to have a conversation. I want somebody that is approachable. I want somebody that's personable. Um, you know, oftentimes, even at the international level, when the umpires come into our dugout to do the helmet check or the bat check, I can get a sense, even in that limited, uh, that limited exchange, with the type of personality I'm going to deal with for that game. Because if they come into the dugout and the head's down and they're not making eye contact and they're not communicating, then that tells me one of a few things. They're either they're either nervous because this may be one of their first big assignments, and as a top three country in the world. I can appreciate that if you have one of our games, you know that you're going to be officiating against a, a good team and therefore uh, you want to be at your best. Or there's a bit of a chip on a shoulder or a bit of an arrogance associated with how they see themselves as the official. But either way, neither of them are good because it means that at some point in time in that game, when I have to go on the field and, and question a call or have a conversation, I can anticipate that this is probably going to be more confrontational than it needs to be because he or she has set the tone when they walked into the dugout before the game even started. So I'm very, very, very much about reading um, non-communicative uh, actions and behaviors from officials, because that sets the tone for me in terms of knowing what I can expect when the game's gonna start. Of course, then we get to home plate and we have our plate meeting, and there's another example or another opportunity for me to further assess the type of relationship that I'm going to have with the four officials that are on the field tonight. But I am always studying the behavior, the attitude, the eye contact, the interaction that they are willing to have with coaches, because that goes a long way to tell me the type of rapport we're likely going to have over the next seven innings. So to talk a little bit about pregame, I think it's important as an official that you visit both benches. And again, I'm speaking to all levels, whether we're talking U14, whether we're talking international. I think visiting both benches gives you an opportunity to introduce yourself to coaches to have a smile, to, to you know, the handshake, the eye contact, to have a good game coach, um, but just it sets the tone in terms of the mood 
and the atmosphere that you would like that game to be played in. Doing the equipment check pieces. I don't know at the younger level how much of that's important, but I do think it's an important thing because we want kids to be safe. So, you know, are the bats okay? Um, are the helmets okay? Do they have a face shield on their helmets? Is the catching equipment okay? I don't think it's, um, over, I don't think it would be crossing the line whatsoever for an official to be paying attention to those things so that we're ensuring safety across the board. Because sometimes you have people coaching athletes when you've got 15, 16 kids, one coach, maybe two coaches, you don't see everything. There's a lot going on. And the younger the kids, the more directions you're pulled in as a coach, the greater the, <coughs> excuse me, the greater the likelihood that you're going to miss something. So if an official can help by coming over to the, to the dugout and simply paying attention to some of those little things, it likely saves you know, challenges down the road. I think being clear about game expectations. What do you expect of the athletes in terms of the game? Moving them on and off the field quickly, making sure the warm-up pitches are prepared. We know how games can drag on, especially at the youth level. So what are the things that you can employ from the coaches, from the umpire meeting at the, at the coaches meeting at home plate that sets the tone for keeping the game moving and keeping everybody moving as fast as they can so that we're not there for two and a half hours. Um, if a call is questioned, how do you want to be approached? How would you like a coach to come out and approach you? It is absolutely a coach's right to come on the field and ask a question if he or she feels as though a call has been missed or, um, or they want further clarification. So as the official, how do you want that to happen? I think that's another thing that at the, at the plate meeting that you can convey. I've had umpires at plate meetings say, if you have a concern, if you think we've missed a call, when you call time, please come out and talk to us. You know, we, 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 we're trying to manage the game. We're going to make mistakes just like players make mistakes, just like coaches make mistakes. Come out and let's have a conversation. We don't need it to be confrontational. This is not a win-lose relationship. It's about coming out and having some dialogue. When that's said by an official, what it does for me is, once again, it sets an expectation that I can now come on the field, I can now question a call, and as long as I do it in a respectful manner, we're going to have a healthy conversation. I'm not going to win that call. If, a, if an outer safe or a ball or a strike has been called, they're not going to reverse the call because I come on the field. But if I can at least have a conversation to ask whether or not they felt they had a good look at that call, to, whether or not they felt they were in the right position, if I can ask them to get help from another official, the bottom line is I come away satisfied that my, my concern has been addressed and I've done it in a way that they feel comfortable um, and that I've asked the question, but I haven't made them look bad or been disrespectful to them in front of crowd or in front of my team or the opposing team. So I think those things, you know, they, they set the tone at the very beginning for what you want the expectation to be as an official. And the more, uh, the more communicative you are, the more open you are, the more inviting you are to having people ask questions, engaging in conversation, I think the, the, the greater the likelihood that, that you're going to have less issue when it comes to managing games. And in those moments when something does go wrong, like we do have a blown call, or we do have a play that's missed that has uh, an implication on the game, I think coaches are going to be more reasonable when they approach you about things because a precedent has been set in terms of the tone and behavior that's required or expected. So at the end of the day, for me, it's about what we should expect from one another, which is respectful interaction. We should both be approachable. Um, we should be willing to meet one another halfway. As an official, I need to be willing to hear your explanation when you come to give me an explanation for something I've asked, but you also need to be willing to hear what I'm asking. You know, Andrew made a point earlier about coming to the field and you're meeting an official that's 10 steps from home plate with his or her arms folded, and immediately they're in a defensive position. So immediately the impression they're giving me is that I'm really not open to having you come out and question what I just did. I realize it's your right to do so, but I'm really not hearing what you have to say because you're out here questioning a decision I made and I don't like that. Now, that may not be what the official means to convey, but that's absolutely a tone that they send when they come and they respond in that way. I think clear and honest communication around what is expected, which I've just touched on a number of times, is really important. One of the things that I respect so much about officials is when they admit if they missed a call. You know, as a coach, I make mistakes every game. I call a steal, we get thrown out. I call a bunt, we don't get it down. I send a runner to home plate, she gets thrown out. I mean, I make mistakes, players make mistakes, so do umpires. 
And one of the things that I respect the most about an umpire is when they will come and say, hey, you know what, I think I missed that one. What, what else can I say to that? I don't have to like the fact that they missed it, but they're at least acknowledging that what I thought I saw was accurate and you're gonna to try to be better for the next time. And I understand that. Rather than standing and telling me, you didn't make a mistake when I know that you did, my player knows that you did, and sometimes half the stadium knows that you did. So I think it's, it's okay to acknowledge when a mistake is made because we all make them. And we simply want to, above all, understand that we're all human, we're in this game together, mistakes are made every game, on both sides and often the team that wins is the one that makes the fewest but officials make them as well and i think it's okay to acknowledge when you do and to, to that point to me it's about it's not about being right it's about getting it right you know we can have a disagreement you may not necessarily like me i can think of an international official that i've had difficulties with over the years um, because i just don't like his 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 plate call i think he's a good official on the basis i think behind the plate he struggles with consistency of strike zone it happens because he he the umpires in a country that doesn't have what i would consider to be world-class pitching it's not his fault it's just the, the way the situation is when i bumped into him at a banquet or off the field we stand and we have great casual conversation do i like seeing him behind home plate in a game when we're playing absolutely not but it doesn't it doesn't take away from the fact that I can have a civil conversation with this man off the plate, off the field, because he's an umpire in the ball game. He's a person off the field. And so I think the, you know, the ability to recognize that we all play a role, but at the end of the day, we're people first is important. And the other thing that I think is really important for officials and especially younger officials is that you are already in charge of the game. You get to call outs and safes. You get to tell coaches, uh, whether or not they get to stay in games or don't based on behavior. When you're already in charge, you don't have to prove that you're in charge. And I think sometimes young officials get baited into confrontations, sometimes with older coaches. Sometimes coaches aren't being as respectful as they need to be and they deserve exactly what they get. But I also think that there are times that because they are a younger, less experienced official and they may be challenged by a little older, more experienced coach, you become defensive. When the coach comes out to, to ask the question, you're already deciding what your answer is going to be instead of listening to what the coach has to ask you. And so I think it's really improve, important to understand that if you're the person that's on the field, wearing blue and making the calls, you're already in charge. And we understand that as coaches and we respect that. We simply want the opportunity to be heard when we do have a question and for us to be able to work together so that at the end of the day, you get to enjoy the game you officiate and I get to enjoy the game I coach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's exactly what I was hoping for, which is that there were some common threads between the presentation that both you and Andy gave. Um, Andy, feel free to come back if you'd like. Um, you know, so one of the one of the key points that I, I took away that's a common thread between the two of yours is uh, some of the traits that you both talked about uh, respect approachability personability those those key traits that um that you think are important in an official but also um found it interesting the two of you both commented on the fact that the plate conference sets the tone for the game and for all of those people who are um there's a lot of people on the call who have a lot of experience and and so a lot of us would be would be teaching those level ones and twos and threes. And I think we just can't highlight or stress enough how important it is to, to do that plate conference. Um, you know, you're hearing it from two coaches that, that that's really important. So I have a number of questions. Um, there's uh, quite a few people who are engaged in the chat. So um, first one was uh, for you, Andy. Um, have you always been this communicative or have you learned to be through your years in softball? Uh, I think that comes from experience and learning. Um, and I also, you know, I pick the brains of other coaches uh, and umpires, but, you know, through coaching, we do learn, especially uh, from the, the Canadian Sport Institute, we're given skills and, and you know, we're, we're um, you know, exposed to ways to better handle communication and, and we're, we have opportunities to practice that as well. So, you know, it, it, it's come from experience and I wasn't probably as, as good of a communicator with umpires prior, but I, I'm learning, still learning. Mark, this one's for you. Uh, how do you deal with language barriers in the international games when it comes to um, discussions and meetings? 
there usually always tends to be at least one, likely two officials on the field that, that speak English. And if there are, for example, in 2018, when the world championships were in Japan, and we would have a Japanese official, there are interpreters. So if a call is made um, by a Japanese official uh, that is being questioned, there's someone that can come on the field and actually translate um, in Japanese the question that's being asked by, uh, by the coach. So we're very fortunate in that sense that if, if, uh, if we run into that situation, there's people around that can help us ensure that we can communicate very clearly with the official. Awesome. Um, another one for you, Mark. If one of your players is angry and upset with a call, what is your strategy as an elite coach? Well, the number one rule with our team is that the only person that talks to umpires is me. So it's very clearly understood that you don't have to like what just happened, but that's not your business. That's my business. So you can come and complain to me. And if you feel something's been done unfairly or, or you don't feel as though you're getting a fair shake from an official, then you come and you explain the issue to me. And, and then I'll basically decide from there if it's a balls and strikes thing as a former pitcher. I understand that every umpire has a has a strike zone, and I tell our pitchers and our hitters, your responsibility is to learn how to adapt to their strike zone. That's not going to change tonight. You're going to have to change and figure out what you need to be able to do. So there are some non-negotiables where if players are complaining. You know, my comment to them is it's the same for both teams. So they got to figure it out, and we have to figure it out too. But if there's a situation where we have, uh, you know, a player who feels that what maybe it's the catcher that feels as though the umpire is squeezing our pitcher or um, maybe they seem to be particularly hard on leadoffs. Then I will make it a point to find, you know, an opportunity to slide beside the umpire, start a casual conversation, and just talk a little bit about what it is that, um, that you know, or, or ask the question: What is it that you're seeing in our leadoffs? Are we? Do you think we're coming off early? I try to pose questions in a way that are non-accusatory, and I'm basically asking for information from them, and because their information is going to tell me the way I need to go back and approach it with my athletes. So I do my best to gather information where I can, and um, and then if, if the opportunity presents itself to maybe plant the seed um, for something that may work in our favor down the road. Nice. Is there a point in time when either of you would encourage your players to learn to officiate? Well, I grew up in a house with a level five official. My dad was an umpire for many years, so I, I have the utmost respect for umpires. Um, but to be honest with you, I, I um, it's not something that I've ever thought about. I mean, of course, I've been in the game long enough now. There's not many years left to do anything else. But, I, you know, I think that if a player wants to stay involved and be a part of it, I probably would be more apt to tell them to coach than I would to umpire, to be honest with you, because I think former players, especially players that have competed at an elite level, have got so much to offer young aspiring kids about how to play the game the right way, how to learn the skills that that most coaches don't know how to teach. Because when you've played at a, an elite level, um, you 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 learn the shortcuts to being successful at the next level. And you know it's one of the reasons that I have constantly encouraged former national teamers to come back because there's an understanding they have of how the game is played that the average person doesn't understand and never will for no other reason than they've not had those experiences. So I would be more apt to encourage former players to coach than I would to officiate, but not because I have anything against officiating. Now, do you actually, now that you've said that one of the, one of the um, I'm chairing the Softball Canada Umpires Recruitment and Retention Committee. And one of the things that we've identified as a bit of a gap is that we're not actually talking to players mm -hmm. about officiating as often as we should. And I'm wondering to your point, are you, at, are, is somebody actually talking to players about coaching i mean i don't really care how people stay involved in the game but players are the future of our game regardless of whether it's coaching or umpiring i'm just wondering if people are actually actively talking to people at all age levels especially our elite program about about staying in the program after their playing career is over well i know that a number of our players from across the country have affiliations with former clubs that they have come up through and played with and many of them go back and run clinics and are associated with them and in fact uh, over the last two winters when they were training in their own provinces many of them were training at the clubs of the at the um, facilities of the club teams that they previously played for as youth players so it's neat to see the sort of the alumnus correlation to that um, but we have some players certainly we've got a bunch of players that have coached at the NCAA level so they have some professional coaching 
Uh, and I've had some of them come to me and say, beyond my playing days, I would like to coach. What would you recommend? What do I need to do for uh, coach education? Uh, the other reality of it is, is that some of them don't necessarily have an aptitude to coach. I mean, just like not everybody can be an umpire. So I'm very, you know, particular about those I, I encourage to do it because I, I want to make sure it's going to be a good experience for them as well. It's, it's no sense in encouraging somebody to do something if they don't appear to have an aptitude to be successful at it. But I think it would be, uh, I think it would be a great idea, not only and we're talking at the national team level, but if you think about your junior national championships and your senior women's open championships, I think it would be great to have run some kind of a poll or survey at those events to ask uh, players if they would have any interest in officiating. And did you know what the, the levels of the teams like Canada Games or, or some of the provincial teams that you've been involved in, do you know if there's been any conversations with players at that level about whether or not they're interested in pursuing a, a different kind of path in the sport? Well, you know, like Mark said, a lot of the players, you know, are university players and, and even Canada Games, they assist in doing clinics. And so they get that little taste of what the coaching through the instruction might be like. And I think they tend, that's the, the path that they tend to go to. But, you know, there's the athletes I work with, I always tell them there's, you know, another path to the Olympics. If the Olympic is your dream and, you you, you know, you've identified that perhaps that being a player is not the path that, that that's going to get you there maybe officiating is the way if, if an, being an olympian is going to be your dream um but i think you know i've had uh you know i I've, I've encouraged my athletes to you know at least take a level one umpire clinic just to see you know learn the rules i can't i can't teach everything to them and so if i can create some opportunities that'll educate them you know i tell them to take it um take a rules clinic and and you know some of them will just uh grasp onto it and really like doing the umpiring and some again they're just not comfortable doing it but uh, both ways I think both pathways I've kind of talked about that you know there is other ways to stay in the game and it's it's how you choose to do that. Nice. Um, Mark in your presentation you talked about um, one of the traits that you see as really valuable is that being personable and you can tell that right from the moment that the umpires enter the dugouts you know and and you talked about sort of the umpires visiting both benches actually at every other level aside from from probably the four umpire system the umpires can go to both benches in four umpire system we kind of do a two and two and then we meet at the plate but mm -hmm. I, I i liked your your comment about you can tell as soon as they enter the dugout about what kind of person and approachability that you're going to experience in that game i'm wondering mm -hmm if you could um is there a line where it's like yeah we want them to be approachable but but maybe they we don't want them to be too friendly and if if there was uh things that it, that somebody could do that would cross that line in in your opinions that would be helpful i think for some people i don't know that i can think of a time where i've had an experience where i would consider an umpire to have crossed the line there are certainly some umpires that are more talkative than others. Um, and often they are the junior umpire that's doing their first Canada Cup or doing their first plate in a, in a game of consequence. And they're, they're anxious and they're excited and they should be. And you can tell the nerves are there for them, just like the player that plays in their first big game in that environment. And I'm happy for them. And, and uh, it's a major accomplishment for them and something to be recognized. But I can't say that I've had any of those situations where they've ever crossed the line. I'm simply very, very mindful and studious to, um, you know, just their openness to being friendly, I guess would be the word I would use. You know, I, I mean, we, we end, I understand at the end of the day, they've got to make calls that some will go for us and some will go against us. And that's part of the game. I just want to know that when I come out of the dugout to ask a question that I'm going to be met with an open mind and in a respectful tone, and we can have a conversation, um, and I can go back to the dugout and the game resumes. That's really what I'm looking for at home plate. I'm just looking for very clear direction on how you want things to be and a consistency. And as I'm sure you know, Frankie, better than anybody, as players, all we want is consistency. As I've said for years as a former pitcher, if it's a strike in the first inning, it better be a strike in the seventh inning. That's all I care. If it's the same for both teams, then we'll we'll roll with the punches. Nice. Andy, do you have anything you want to add to that? or? No, I think Mark summed that up pretty good. Uh, I, you know, I'm the same way. I'm always reading. Uh, in fact, even at Canada Games, when we scout and at the, you know, at the University of Canadians, we actually scout the umpires as well. So we, we it helps our pitchers. So we're again, we're getting a read. Like, 
you know what's their strike zone look like is that pit, is that umpire able to move you know to get in in uh, position really well and which umpires do we hope that we can get you know I'd love to have a say in the umpires that I get in the final game I think that would be great but you know I, that that's you know obviously not going to happen but I think it's the same thing we uh, you know we just do our due diligence trying to prepare ourselves and give our our players the best information uh, we can to so that they can go into the game um, very well planned and very well prepared for the opposition that we're going to you know face. I would also say, Andy, just to build on a comment that Andrew has made around scouting officials, you know that is something that that is done at our level almost unconsciously. You know, you're always looking to find out what their tendencies are. You know, for example, you know you've got some umpires that when you've got a runner on second base, and even though they're umpiring second base, you know they're following the pitch to the plate or they're looking towards third because there's a runner on third. And in those situations, we're telling our players, you can take an extra three or four steps or you can leave early because they're not paying any attention to you. Now, this is after we've watched enough times to know that this is a natural habit by this official, but you can be sure that, you know, the higher the level you officiate, the more you are being scrutinized and your behaviors are being scrutinized every bit as much as the opposition team. There's a question in the chat. Um... We can all get very passionate about the game we play and sometimes emotions can run high with your players. What advice would you give to an up and coming umpire in dealing with players that question umpires calls or especially their close calls? And that's a really, that's a great question because it's a hard skill for some of our junior officials to learn. I'll let Andrea take a stab at that one first. Um. Wow, I think the biggest thing, you know, from my experience is we, you can't let it get to you. You can't take it personally. Um, like Mark said, we we know that you have a role and you have to make those calls. Um, but you know, even with with my players, you have to have some calming mechanisms, some refocus things that you need to do to get yourself back into the game and 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 um, you know hope that it doesn't affect your performance. Um, I think when my players are, you know, it's, I'm the same with Mark. My players aren't allowed to make comments or do any, anything that, that's going to alter, you know, uh, how we play or, or, you know, performance of another team. We just try and keep it all in check. And I think that, you know, there's things that you can do to calm or, you know, relaxation things that we do, even a quick just tense the body in the, in the, in the, um, you know, you know, the batter's box. And I think the experience, uh, I've had times where, if I'm picking my Canada games team, I've brought an umpire and I've asked that umpire, hey, I got to see how my players react. And we're in evaluation process and I want to see if you're calling balls and strikes and adjusting it or you're calling the pause, how they're going to react. Because I need to know if I can have this player on my team. And and so working, you know, with an umpire that way gets, you know, they get to learn. Uh, um, I never throw them under the bus. I always tell them afterwards what we've done and why we've done it. Um, but experience will just help and and hoping that coaches can manage the players um you know to the same behaviors that, that we you know act, or you know the same things that we do on the field that they don't they're not doing anything differently that we're doing you know frankie i take it back to the plate conference around setting yeah. expectation you know if mm -hmm. i were officiating and i made a call and a young person flew off the handle a little bit um what i would do is look for the first opportunity between the innings to talk to the coach about the behavior that I have observed of the young person and that if that happens again obviously there's going to be a consequence but that that young person needs to be they need to be talked to and they need to be coached around appropriate behavior when things don't quite go their way because kids you know you've got 15 different kids that come from different different family backgrounds with 15 different histories and you have no idea as to why one beha child behaves one way and another child behaves differently but I think Again, it's 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 a coaching, mentoring, supporting role where if I can go to a coach and I can make he or she aware of a behavior I'm observing, then my my expectation is that they're going to deal with that now because I've just given them a heads up of a behavior that if that happens two months from now in a game that matters and that's one of your better players, you're going to lose a kid because of an inappropriate action or behavior reaction. You now have an opportunity to be proactive and and help that young person manage that that temperament, but uh, you know, I think initially it's really about trying to help them understand that there's a better way to manage it. And, and you know, to Andrea's point, when we do inter-squad games, often I'll umpire and, and I'll call strikes balls 
and spread the zone on certain players or I'll call a hitter out on a pitch that's a ball because I want to see how they react. Now, they, they know by now, if they've caught on by now when I'm doing that, they know what I'm doing. But, you know, there was a period of time when they didn't know. And it's interesting to watch how they react to things because in a game, if that's what the umpire calls for a strike, you can be as upset as you want, but how are you going to handle the next pitch? Because that's really what matters. So I think, you know, the more we as coaches can help kids be prepared for those difficult situations and the more as officials we can help coaches coach kids through those difficult situations, the better the sport. Nice. There, there's times and behaviors that we don't, um, like I don't hear, I can't hear what my shortstop might be saying to, a, you know, a player or what my, my, you know, comments under their breath that my player might make to an umpire. So if that is happening, you know, I want to know about it because like Mark says, it's up to me to deal with that and manage it. And so I'm not astute to everything. I can't, I don't have eyes and ears everywhere. So if we don't see it and we don't know about it, um, the only way, you know, to know about it is for an umpire to say, hey, can you, you know, just, this is what's happening with your player, you know, deal with it, please. Have either of you ever had an instance, Andy, you mentioned that sometimes you're going to use your lineup card as an opportunity to have a conversation with an umpire. Have you ever had an, an instance where you've actually gone out to have a conversation, but the umpire started talking to you before you had a chance to say anything, and they were talking about a play or a call? Have you, have either of you ever had that? Mm -hmm. I have. Did, yeah. did you actually want to talk about the situation that they brought up? <laughs> well, you know, I guess I, the way I see it is that it's proactive on their part. You know, again, we're partners in managing the game. And if he or she are willing to have a conversation with me and share something they've seen or something they, even if it's a call that went against us, I mean, it, it, at least it opens the lines of communication. It allows me then to offer my take on that same situation. But we're talking, like there's dialogue happening. And I'm a firm believer, although umpires will swear this isn't true, and my dad and I used to argue about this all the time, I believe umpires make up calls. <laughs> and, I, and I say it as a player. I, I know for sure that there's been times in games especially big games where I'd throw a pitch that was a strike and in a big situation and it would be called a ball. And I'd look at the umpire at home plate and he'd look back at me and I know that he knows he missed that call. And two pitches later, I throw a pitch that may be slightly off the plate, but it's a strike. You can't tell me that subconsciously you weren't making up for the one you missed. I believe you were. I think it's human nature. So I think at the end of the day, if I'm respectful and I go out there and I state my case and I do it respectfully, I think that as an official, just the way we're wired as humans, that if I walk away from a situation feeling like, you know what, I did make a mistake there. I believe that the next time there's a close play, we will in all likelihood get the benefit of the doubt. And that's really all you can ask for. Well, I think in the advent of like the superior technology we have, it's really hard to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll leave it at that. Um, I would like the two of you to close this off by, um, Oh, I'm, I'm getting, I've had more than one comment just so the two of you know about the fact that people would love to have something like this at our next blue convention, just saying. So you may be, you know, getting an invite to that, but um, we are a little bit over time, but I think I'd like to finish with, with something along the lines of, since this was a webinar about communication from your perspective, I'm wondering if you can share a story that would help to, um, educate our audience about an instance where an umpire utilized some kind of communication skill set to like it was the epitome like just top notch this is this was the situation this was the you know this was how you approached it and, and this was what the what the umpire either did or said that you thought was just like you know what this was such a great example of communication skills like 1000 I'm sure you, you want to like start, start Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Mine is really non field of play oriented. It was at the uh, Olympic qualifier in 2019 in, in, uh, in Surrey, where we were just having a heck of a time with um, one of the W uh, uh, ESC officials who just, um, it just seemed like every time we were about to play, our time to warm up was changed our when we could do lines on the field was changed it just it just seemed to be constant and you know players are creatures of habit and we have routines mm -hmm. and when these routines get broken people get cranky 
And my job is to keep them calm and, and relaxed. And when they're getting upset about routines being broken, and I don't really understand the rationale for why the routines are being forced to be broken. And I'm getting comments like, well, we have to because games are behind or we have to. And I'm saying, but you can't penalize our players' preparation because the game fell behind. That, that's got nothing to do with me or nothing to do with us. This really kind of happened over the course of the week to the point where when this person would come into our dugout, I'd just leave because I knew if I stayed, we were going to have an argument about something. Um, because I just so disagreed with the abruptness, the abrasiveness and the behavior and the constant coming in and almost trying to bully us into seeing things their way. So I went to one of the other officials, Don Bracey, who's a Canadian official who was at the games. And I basically talked to Don about the fact that, you know, this is consistently happening and it is disrupting our preparation and it's uncalled for and it doesn't make any sense to me. And I'm not going to change the way we prepare to accommodate this individual. So I just need you to know that if behind the scenes you're hearing that the Canadian coach is being unreasonable, this is what's going on. And, and I'm going to continue to be unreasonable where this is concerned to protect my players preparing. And he just did a wonderful job of buffering things. And he would come to our dugout instead of the other person coming to our dugout because he understood what I was trying to do from a preparation standpoint. He also understood that, yeah, there's a, there's a there's a concern around moving you know timelines and things of that nature, but I just thought he handled it so professionally um, around simply injecting himself into it without bringing any notice or fanfare and allowing us to continue with our preparation the way we needed to while avoiding what was likely to have been a confrontation had he not gotten in the middle of it. And I I'm very appreciative for the way he handled that. Well, so that that's just so ironic because I just talked to Don Bracy the other night, and he, uh, you just reminded me he wanted me to say hi to you. So hi from Don Bracy. But if you, could, <laughs> if you, so just so all, all of the audience members know, Don Bracy was acting as a technical official, which is a WBSC role, which is an off-diamond non-umpire role. Um, but Don was an umpire at one time, so mm -hmm. I'm glad that he could Good help one. facilitate a solution for you there. Um, yeah, so I was I was kind of looking for like an on diamond something that kind of happens and, and an umpire kind of was able to um, to communicate well and and it sort of like just calmed the situation like in the, but if you don't have one that's sort of sad but <laughs> <laughs> Andrea do you have one? Well, I've got one. Yeah, I might have one. So and, and this is this was you know had a little bit of a language barrier too. But we were at the, the 2017 Canada Games, and uh, anyways, I had really been working. This was my goal for uh, the year was to really really learn the rules inside and out and be really prepared uh, going into the Canada Games for my players. And there was some controversy with different umpires I had talked to prior to it about. Um, taking the orange bag was just only on a drop third strike. And so I, I, I was confident that I knew this rule. And it happened to be that my, I had all three uh, uh, female officials, which is the first time I've I'd even had um, a, a whole umpire crew that was female. And anyway, we, we, it happened to be that my first baseman fielded a ball that took her into foul territory. And, and she kind of left back at the bag and, and, and touched the orange bag. And so the call was that the player was was safe, and and that was you know one of the few times that that I came out and and was very confident that I knew the rule, and and um, so the umpire wasn't quite sure, and said and just the confident demeanor that she had, and said you know what, we're gonna check this, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we get this call right, um, give us a few minutes, um, and just the presence and and again the way she talked to me. Um, they went to the UIC, they, they handled everything just so professionally and came back and we got the call and, you know, I was just so happy because I'm, I'm nervous going out, you know, that's, you know, you don't often have to, you know, question those rule applications. And so I just thought that the way she handled it, um, you know, and, and speaking French and just, you know, it, it was the demeanor that she had that, uh, you know, really made the situation, um, you just, it was very positive for everyone. Thanks, Especially Andy, with you know, yeah. That's such no, a sorry, great. Go ahead. No, sorry, I was. I didn't mean to. I just. Uh, I thought you were. I thought you were done. So I didn't mean to cut you off. But I thought that that's such a great example. It shows like approachability, integrity of the game. Because to Mark's point, the crew wanted to get the call right. Um, professionalism, right? Like just knowing that maybe they didn't have the confidence in the rule, so they had to check. Um, you know and being being willing to willing to have that conversation with you and willing to have a conversation with their partners 
Um, so that that's a that's a really good example. So I'm not going to put you on the spot, Mark. If you don't have enough. <laughs> I also don't. You know, I'm I'm racking my brain, but I, I mean, there's been lots. I'm sure there's just nothing coming to mind. That's totally okay. Um, yeah, that's. I mean, I could I could ask you to provide like the alternate, but I think I don't want to end on that note. So I would I'll just no. leave it at that and no. say thank you. <laughs> Thank you both so much for your for your time and um, for your effort in putting together the uh, presentation. And as I said, lots of positive comments about um, about how the value in having the two of you come and provide your perspective on communication. Honestly, it is the one theme that goes across the entire umpire curriculum through levels one through five and internationally. Um, but it's also if you go to any umpire clinic at any time of the year or a blue convention you'll see sessions on game management and preventative umpiring and all of those things at their core have communication and so this this has just been really valuable so i really appreciate the two of you spending some time with us tonight for those of you in the audience thank you for coming thank you for participating and i would um like to welcome you to the last softball canada 2021 webinar which will be on may 10th it will be called the balancing act and the focus will be on recruitment and so if you have, have leagues or or um presidents of associations that you deal with please send out the webinar link the entire focus of this last webinar will be how did these four amazing umpires in our program balance playing umpiring and going to school and they are all um like super successful. We have two that are recent WBSC certified. We have one that's going through the process of being WBSC certified, and we have a level four male from BC that will be. So I'm just really excited to host these four in that presentation. If you if you have anyone out there that's ever thought about umpiring, this would be the session for them to come to. The timing is very deliberate because although we are still in a global pandemic, I am hoping that everyone in the country will be playing and umpiring at some point in the next eight weeks. So the timing of this webinar is um, meant to align with your clinics and with your mini clinics and with trying to promote umpiring as another avenue in the sport. So thank you so much, um, Andy and Mark, so much appreciate your time and uh, thank you to everybody in the audience. No worries, thank you. Yeah, take care. Thanks, Thanks Frankie. Bye everyone.